Year 15, the rule of you're getting fatter. If there's one word that can describe head shoots, that word is decadence. Yes, once an incredible fortress wrought together by the selfless sacrifice and work of but a handful of dwarves, all toiling side by side with their dwarven brothers, none better than the other and all as important as the next. But now the fortress lies in chaos and disarray. Even worse, it's clear that a great divide has risen in between its inhabitants. The ordinary dwarf is homeless and lacking in even the most basic alcohol provisions because they cannot afford it, while the nobility, those that supposedly must lead our race into prosperity, sleeps in lavish rooms made of adamantine and never want for anything, all while making demands for the most frivolous of items. Seriously, clear glass statues? As if that wasn't bad enough, they're protected by a corrupt military that will follow its orders blindly as long as it leads them to more adamantine armor that they don't deserve. It falls on me, then, to bring headshoots back to life, and I will do it by taking us back to our roots, to when each dwarf worked for the common good, for the people. Somebody has started some kind of construction on the bottomless chasm, but has not left any indication as to what it might be. However, I quickly realize that this will serve very well for the plans I have for those pesky elves. Meanwhile, the previous ruler seems to have put in orders for adamantine everything in the military. While my first instinct is to cancel all the orders, Hedshoots already has more than an adequate army, and what's the point in spending more resources on it when all of that could be going to other endeavors, endeavors that could benefit the people... It doesn't take me long to realize that if I want to get anything done here, I will have to get in the military men's good graces, lest one of them hammer me to death like they did my brother. So I let the current orders stand. But mark my words, this will be the last equipment this army will see for a while, so they better make good use of it. Hellioning becomes part of the Royal Guard. Even worse than the military, the Royal Guard doesn't even mask its true allegiance. Disgusting. Migrants arrived. Excellent. The fortress could use some more dwarves to join the ranks of the proletariat. However, word reaches me that amongst them is a new countess. This bourgeois has called in reinforcements, finally realizing that the growing socialist movement in Headshoots threatens the status quo. This will not stand. Meanwhile, the corpse of the dwarf Royal II lies on the ground, ignored by everyone. At first, his name leads me to think that this is an ex-example of the noble class, so I feel little sympathy for his disgrace. However, someone informs me that he had been, in fact, a pump operator, leaving a fellow member of the working class to suffer this in. Dignity, the shame. This man is a hero, and he shall be treated accordingly. This is to say he'll be treated like everyone else because nobody deserves special credit for doing their job. I order his body put in the mass graveyard. Apparently, Manic Mole fell into the bottomless chasm while working on my project. Well, it's always a shame to lose good workers. Sacrifices must be made for the greater good. The greater good. There is no body to store in the graveyard, so he will have to live on in our memories. You will be remembered, Magic Mop, or, or was it Marvin Mose? Or, uh, oh, oh, yes, the, the people will remember you, Mayo Month. I've had it with these skeletal rat men, delaying the construction of my project. They're not even near it. They're ten levels deeper into the inaccessible chasm. Guess I'll have to send the military to deal with them. Eventually, they make it there, and the threat is contained. I guess there are some uses for these glorified gorillas. Holistic Detective was the first one in, and as much as I hate to admit it, that murderous monster did a fine job dispensing of these horrible creatures. While perusing the fortress, I find that parts of it are getting increasingly... wet. 
Apparently we're flooding. Someone saw it fit to connect the damned river into a series of rooms, open the floodgates connecting them, and then conveniently forgot to close them. Finding the right lever is going to be, of course, fucking impossible. I suspect sabotage by the ruling elite, probably as part of a scheme to turn the populace of the fortress against me. Ha! <laughs> They'll have to try harder. I've sealed the flooding areas in time, and now I can safely look for this blasted lever. Apparently at some point, Kutan, a furnace operator, was struck down by... something. Not entirely sure what it was. Foul play? Most likely. To the graveyard with him, I will sort this out later. Another project-related accident. Manuel Calavera, recently arrived noble, fell to his death. I'd like to say he'll be missed, but that's a lie. The rich pig deserved it. Who knew that the project would bear such unexpected fruits? Tinny Tim becomes possessed and takes over a workshop. This fortress needs an exorcist, not an overseer. Eventually, he comes out of his trance with an amulet with images of a roach on it. Perhaps a metaphor for how all the opulence is a mask for the lowliest bugs of all. The nobility? Yes. Good work, Tinny Tim. Very good work indeed. Behold, Kasponun, the quiet soot. This is a Galena amulet. All craft's dwarfship is of the highest quality. It is decorated with rope reed and cave spider silk, and encircled with bands of Galena, copper, pineapple opal, and alder. This object menaces with spikes of human bone. On the item is an image of squares in Galena. On the item is an image of a large roach in gold opal. We lost White Cloak to yet another mishap during the building of the project. As it turns out, you cannot attach a building only to a bridge. Back to the drawing board. I'll find a way to make it work regardless of how many lives it takes. Oh, uh, apparently White Cloak was our resident broker, manager, and mayor, so there seems to be a slight uh, break in the chain of command. I've assigned myself these roles. For the good of the people, of course. For some reason, though, the broker is now the good professor, who is also a champion and as such refuses to work, again proving that the military is simply an extension of the bourgeois. So our fortress does not have an accurate count of its stocks at the moment. I've replaced him with the first dwarf that came across my path, a peasant that now has a higher purpose in life, counting, for the good of the people, of course. In what can only be described as a horrific accident, a child drowned today after deciding that the best place to get a drink was from the flooded section. He was then swept into a channel that I'd made to drain some water while I blocked off that section. I'm expecting spectacular meltdowns from his parents, the Belgian and Crackmaster, any day now. In an attempt to claim these rooms, which are now proving to be more trouble than they're worth, I've diverted the water flow into the bottomless pit. In my investigation with regards to whoever built these damned death traps, I learned that some of the older dwarves, that a previous ruler who shared my hatred for the elitist pigs, had designated them as actual traps for those wastes of flesh, but had never put his plan into action. A subsequent ruler, looking to ingratiate himself with them, much like a dog will do tricks for its master to get scraps, then disassembled it and obviously failed to take the proper precautions. Oh, what now? Apparently Yalius was throwing a tantrum. Apparently he was offended that her rooms were not up to snuff. This surprised me because she didn't, in fact, have any rooms, so I really don't see how she can complain about them. Oh, also, he lost his wife at some point, but I really couldn't care less about the plight of the nobility. In a rage, she decides to destroy a floor hatch with absolutely no regard to the fact that it might have been in use. Typical. I let him vent. If he becomes more agitated, then, well, we'll just have to take care of that. In fact, I'm starting to see how we can solve all of our problems in one fell swoop. 
No migrants this year, most likely discouraged by the plight of the working class. How I dream of the day that Headshoes will be a shining beacon of socialist progress in which all dwarves will want to live. The strangest Finch slipped and fell while working on the project. Fortunately, he'd finished most of his duties, so it was not a big loss. A thief popped up today. One of our brave pump operators, Robin Daber, did not hesitate to tear him apart, limb by limb. He had to be forcefully conscripted and threatened with an even worse death before he'd do it. But he later understood that sometimes the needs of the people must come before our own. The military, as usual, turned up late and attempted to take all the glory. Not today, good professor. Not today. While overseeing the construction of the floodgates that would be used to unflood the fortress, I noticed one of the champions, X, rush over to one of our mechanics, Toxic Frog. When I asked him what he was doing, he simply muttered, Chin in an animal. The next moment, he'd put clasps on Y and dragged him off to the prison without so much as an explanation. Apparently, Y had disobeyed a production order. From our resident bitch, Yalius. I was livid. The nobility had finally gone too far. I was now more decided than ever to put an end to their abuse of power. More migrants arrived today. Most of them could not afford beds and are sleeping wherever they can. I'm doing my best to keep morale high, but it's not easy when Yalius and the other nobles prance about in their garish clothes, doing their best to ignore their homeless brethren. Evil Kool-Aid Man was struck down, some unruly wild animal, I suppose. A shame, but such is the life in head shoots. The Socialist Division of Labor, however, means that his absence is barely felt. We lost three more dwarves to yet another collapse due to the project. The death toll is high, but we're finally done. I've done the calculations, and this time it should work. It will work! Soon, head shoots will be purged of its worst elements. I call the worst of the nobility to a meeting. Beeswax, Smuggins, Olesh, and that insufferable Yalius. I tell them that I've built them the most lavish accommodations possible. A feat of engineering that has taken the lives of many dwarves, but that will ensure that they're never bothered by noise or smell ever again. Their own private rooms in the middle of the bottomless pit. They're slightly smaller than what they're used to, but that's only for now. Oh, it's perfectly safe. Yes, they mustn't worry. They follow me to their new rooms and are immediately enthralled. They fall over backwards, thanking me. Idiots. Suddenly, a dwarf runs up to me. Goblins spotted in the north. A siege. Not now. I'm so close. Dispatch the military. All of it! Wait, why aren't they responding? They're asleep? Wake up, you idiots! Make yourself useful, you overfed, over-equipped sloths! Jimbeel's squad finally responds and rushes over there. Let's see if all the resources spent on these brutes was actually worth it. They don't make it before one of the other hunters is shot down by the goblin marksman, unfortunately. But they take out the goblin force without too much effort. Heaven protect us, a second contingent of goblins has snuck past, coming through the south side, and made it to the fortress, and most of the military is still returning from the north. A third wave approaches, also from the south. A fourth one from the west. Fuck. Fuck. Oh, gods, they're after me. They're after me. Someone save me. Jimiel makes it to the entrance and goes into a martial trance by the beards. He's slaughtering the goblins. Go, Jimmy, oh, go! The goblin chasing me doesn't even see the axe before it takes his head. Clean off. Covered in goblin blood. 
Jimbio looks at me briefly as if to see if I'm okay, and then rushes off to finish the job. The rest of the goblins, about twenty out of an invasion force of forty or so, terrified at the carnage wrought by our military, make a hasty retreat. We're safe, with only a few lives lost. This could have been so much worse. Thank the mountain for the military. Frog the Second enters a fey mood, but apparently he has a lower spine injury that prevents him from moving too much. That doesn't seem to deter him, as at least trying to get to the workshop. You can do it, Frog. You can do it. It's been a few months after the siege, and things are back to normal, almost. As the winter reaches its end, I've found myself in a strange situation. After being saved by the military, I've taken a shine to them. Perhaps I was wrong about them. Perhaps I was simply too quick to judge them, based simply on a difference in ideology. Not all of them are necessarily as bad as the nobility. Hell, even the nobles haven't been so bad lately. Why, Yaelius has even invited me to eat in his own private dining room tomorrow night. It would be nice to finally eat with some peace and quiet away from the disgusting mess that is the common dining room. Yes, that Yaelius is not so bad. Maybe I'll even give him that adamantine weapon rack he's been griping about. Oh no. What have I become? I'm I'm one of them now. Look at me, his... Is, is this the cost of being in power? Is this transformation inevitable? No, I will not accept this. I will not become this. I must put end to this madness before it finally destroys head shoots. The four nobles are in their rooms, sleeping. Now is the time. I run over there and find the lever, suddenly realizing that I had never actually come up with a good lie to convince them to activate the traps themselves, as I'd originally planned. Oh, well, it doesn't matter anymore. I would have to do it myself. A fitting ending, really, after my horrible fall into corruption. Without a second thought, I pull the lever. After I pulled the lever, I got the expected a section of the cavernous collapse message, and I could see the clouds of smoke around the area, but for some reason, the structure stayed there, floating. A second later, three of the four nobles clipped through the floor and fell to the chasm. The only survivor was Smuggins, who is now living in his floating chasm island until he dies of thirst or until someone extends the bridge to him.